Today on The Champions, we take a look at part two of some of the great men in sport, including Juan Carlos Ferrero. NBA champion and five-time most valuable player, basketball legend Michael Jordan. One of the most remarkable players in the National Football League, Tom Brady. And seven foot five inch Chinese basketball player, Yao Ming. All that and more on The Champions. When one thinks of Spanish sportsmen, it's hard to look past this man, Juan Carlos Ferrero, the country's number one ranked tennis player on the international circuit. Juan Carlos began playing tennis at age seven with his father, Eduardo. At nine, he met the man who is still his coach today, Antonio Martinez Casales. Conscious of the talent of his pupil, Antonio did everything he could to make Juan Carlos become a champion, and he succeeded. Juan Carlos was twice a junior world champion and at age 13 and 14 winning prestigious tournaments in France and everything was going to plan. But at the age of 16 he lost his mother to a long illness and thought about giving the game he loved away. But Juan Carlos decided to continue and since then he has dedicated all his victories to his mother, Rosie. His junior career continued with success and in 1998 he turned professional, quickly accumulating impressive results that allowed him to jump ahead in the ATP ranking. At the end of the 1999 season, Juan Carlos had become the 43rd ranked player in the world. His remarkable entry into professional tennis with highlights including two title challenges in Napoli and Mayer and especially his title in Mallorca against Alex Kurecha earned him the title of Rookie of the Year 1999. The talented Spaniard was honoured with the award during the traditional gala of the ATP Tour in Monte Carlo. From that time on, he was part of the world's tennis elite, a player to be feared, and not only on clay. In 2000, he had two finals in Dubai and Barcelona, two semi-finals in Roland Garros and paris Passe, and of course, the victory in Davis Cup to his credit. 2001 and 2002 were years Juan Carlos firmly established himself as the number one player in Spain. No small feat in a nation that has become one of sport's greatest powerhouses. In 2001, after capturing four titles, including his first tennis masters series shield in Roma and reaching the semi-finals at Roland Garros and the tennis masters cup in Sydney, he surged to a year-end ranking of number five. The following year started off slow with Juan Carlos withdrawing from the Australian Open with a knee injury. But things turned around in a hurry when he notched up wins over Tommy Haas and Carlos Moya to seize his second Masters Series title. But the best was yet to come with the most eagerly awaited victory. On the clay of Roland Garros, he hit the top spot, winning his first Grand Slam title. In two hours and nine minutes, he dominated the final, easily beating Dutchman Martin Verkirk in just three sets. The Spaniard played a perfect match, which allowed him to raise the much coveted Musketeers Cup for the first time in his career. Immediately after Paris came Wimbledon, where he reached the quarterfinals, an excellent result for a clay specialist like him. At 23 and with a Grand Slam win to his credit, Juan Carlos became the number one player in the ATP Champions race. Along with the win in France, all his dreams have come true.
Kelly Slater has been called the greatest surfer of all time. In the decade he's been competing on the professional circuit, he's been world champion and unprecedented six times. He's earned over three quarters of a million dollars in prize money and more than four times that amount in sponsorships and endorsements. His surfing style, technical ability and knowledge of the ocean are simply amazing. A combination of all the very best he's absorbed from watching others during his 22 years of riding waves, plus his own unique talent, skill, creativity and sheer athleticism. He couldn't really compete against it, he went, he's just amazing, he just nailed it. Craziest surfing I've seen. But all the accolades aside, simply put, Cali Slater is one hell of a surfer. Cali has almost single-handedly taken the sport of surfing to a new level. Old school surfers carved elegant lines on longboards and prided themselves on becoming one with the ocean. Callie is the millionaire poster boy of the new school, battling the sea with sharp maneuvers on the lip of the wave and thrilling the crowds with his radical moves. But as if that were not enough, he's also made regular appearances as an actor on television. He's an accomplished musician in a band that has recorded for a major music label and appeared live on the same bill as Pearl Jam. By the accounts of all who know him, compete against him in pro tournaments, or are simply fans who've had the pleasure of meeting or surfing with him, he's an extraordinary human being and an international ambassador for the modern sport of surfing. After racking up five world titles in a row, Kelly eased up and surfed only a few ASP events as he had exceeded every goal he had ever set. Instead, he chose to concentrate on surfing the world's best waves any time he wanted, effectively bowing out of the championship race. But Kelly's passion for the sport and his competitive spirit has seen him return to the circuit, often coming up against the new young guns of the surf. The greatest competitive surfer of all time is keen to etch his name deeper into the record books and with his mighty talent, he is sure to achieve his goal. As with all sports, there is always the up-and-coming talent ready to dominate the scene and rising star on the pro circuit, Hawaiian Andy Irons is certainly one to watch in the future. He has been thereabouts for the last few seasons, but really started to show his potential in 2001, when he cracked the top 10 and showed that he could mix it with the best. And he got off to a flying start in 2001, finishing equal third at Bells Beach in Australia, with a showing that demanded world title attention. Winning two out of five tournaments he entered, including the final event of the year at Halewa, in treacherous conditions, added more clout to his season. He then lost early at Sunset Beach during the all-important ending, but had his best tour finish of his career. His results only got better when in 2002 Andy clinched the world professional surfing title. His competitor Luke Egan needed to finish ahead of leader Andy to stand any chance of taking the season's honours. And when Andy was ousted in the quarterfinals, an upset was in the making. But Luke failed to reach the semis and Andy was quick to celebrate his title success. It's amazing, I don't know, I thought, you know, I got lightning straight twice. And it did not stop there, when the all-conquering Andy Iron successfully defended his title by winning the 2003 Rip Curl Pro World Championship Tournament in Australia. After 10 days of committed surfing, the reigning world champion overcame Australian Joel Parkinson in the final, showcasing an outstanding display of surfing over the Victorian waves. In the process, the 24-year-old became the first entrant to retain the Rip Curl Pro title since fellow Hawaiian Sonny Garcia back in 1990. The champion celebrated his win in style. I've waited my whole life for this point. Pretty much, this is, this is, a, this is probably a, the top of the mountain for me as far as my emotions and feelings go, and just having such a good year and having all, my family here. And I mean, I, I'm feeling incredible right now. I mean, if, if it all ended tomorrow, I'd, I'd die happy man. Andy, the 1998 ASP World Junior Champion, clinched his first WCT event the same year at Huntington Beach, California. He then secured another major victory two years later, again in California. His consistency, along with an abundance of talent, has shone ever since, and the world champion has enjoyed every minute of it.
When Yao Ming hit the NBA, he was the talk of the town. Some said he was going to be a superstar, whilst others were waiting for him to flop. Whatever the thought, Yao is the biggest mystery in basketball in recent times. And no doubt, at 7 foot 5 inches and with the shooting range of a guard, is a fascinating prospect. His five-year career in the Chinese Basketball League with the Shanghai Sharks have been more than impressive. In his final season, he averaged 32.4 points, 19 rebounds and 2.9 assists in 34 games, hitting 72% of his shots and 76% at the free throw line. There was no wonder that in June 2002, Madison Square Garden in New York City heralded the most talked about selection in NBA draft history. The Houston Rockets had just spent their number one overall draft pick on the Chinese center, overpromising Duke guard Jay Williams. The largely black crowd of draft prospects and their contingents booed. They had reason to be displeased. For the past quarter century, black athletes had dominated pro basketball and they saw Yao as a subversive force, an alien threat. Even Charles Barkley, a basketball idol, sniped at Houston's choice and hinted at the consequences. But through deed rather than word, Yao surprised the basketball world at the rate he progressed in his first season. His exploits even left Barkley, a former Phoenix Sun and 76er, with egg on his face. Early in the season, Barkley proclaimed on national television that if Yao managed to score 19 points in a game in the 2002 season, he would kiss the posterior of a rival broadcaster. When Yao scored 20 points a week later against the LA Lakers, payment came due and Barkley paid up. Yao's exploits in the USA are receiving massive media coverage in his homeland, with television audiences doubling to around 15 million people as the Chinese tune in to watch their hero starring in the NBA. With his popularity soaring, he has been in demand for appearances at events. Not only did he support the SARS telethon, but he has been immortalized forever with a life-size model at the Waxworks. The Chinese basketball sensation was honored by his former club, the Shanghai Sharks, early in 2003, when they retired his old number 15 shirt at a special ceremony in China. He may be gone, but Yao will never be forgotten by the Sharks. also unveiled their championship banner from 2002 when Yao led the Sharks to a Chinese league victory. It ended years of frustrating defeats in the finals against rival and fellow NBA player Wang Zhizhi and his powerhouse team, the Beiyi Rockets Club. With Yao and Wang representing the red and yellow flag of China in the NBA, at present there are more international players in the NBA than ever before. When the 2002-2003 season began, 66 foreign basketball players from 34 different nations were on NBA rosters. As recently as three years ago, there were just 32 international players in the league. He has proved eager to face the unique challenges before him, acquitting himself in the face of both heavy hype and criticism. Yao is a star in the making. It's like, uh, what's up, buddy? That's it. <laughs> Yao, the likable star from China, has made it in the highly competitive world of American basketball. He was not as fast, but he was still as great as ever. The question that was asked throughout the basketball world was whether Michael Jordan, a six-time NBA champion and five-time MVP at age 38, could keep up to his own legend, returning with the Washington Wizards. It looked like he had already overcome it, even before the first game, by giving his entire annual wage of $12 million to the victims of September 11. 
This move made it clear that Michael Jordan did not come back for the money, rather for the love of the NBA, a ball game he started playing in 1994. Everybody was excited to see whether Michael, nearing 40, was still able to play at the highest level. At first, it seemed like he had lost a lot of his skills during his two-year hiatus, when he became part owner of the lowly-ranked Wizards, a team in dire need of direction on and off the court. Missing layups and free jump shots in his first game against the New York Knicks at a full Madison Square Garden had many thinking the famous number 23 jersey should have remained in mothballs. However, as the season went on, Michael improved, leading his Wizards to a playoff position, hitting several game-winning shots and turning opponents inside out, just like the Mike of old, and some argue even better. I can compliment anybody. You know, I think I'm, 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 I'm not out trying to search individual accolades. You know, I'm out teaching them, trying to, you know, glue this thing together here and, and make it successful. So that means I have to take a back seat to some of our young players and our young stars. I, I think I can compliment that. You know, um, I'm not chasing the ego. Throughout his comeback season of 2000-2001, Michael appeared unfazed, scoring 20-plus points per game. He also averaged more than six rebounds and five assists every match. But more than anything, he was a mentor for the young, upcoming stars. I want to be the bridge to the next generation, obviously. You know, uh, I played with Dr. J. I played against Dr. J at the time that he was bridging his era to the along with Magic and, and, and Larry, to my generation, or to my era. And I guess I have an obligation to the game is to bridge it to the next. I mean, he's helped the young guys just from, you know what I'm saying, like experience standpoint. He, he has the experience to kind of tell us stuff, and we have to listen because he's been there and done that. Away from the basketball court, Michael relaxes with a round or two of golf. He teamed up with golfing star Tiger Woods at the Olympia Fields Country Club in Chicago, where Tiger was warming up for US Open. But the lure of the basketball court has just been too great for the legend. Michael, regarded as the best player in basketball history, won 10 scoring titles, the league MVP five times, and led the Chicago Bulls to six NBA championships before retiring for the second time following the 1998 season. He never ruled out coming back entirely when he retired in January 1999, saying he was only 99.9% .9 sure he wouldn't play again. But when you're the best in the game, it can be the hardest decision of your life on whether to retire or not. He has amassed an amazing amount of awards and honors in and out of basketball. There has been no greater player than Michael Jordan. The six foot six Brooklyn native spent his college career at North Carolina. He won numerous awards and after his junior year, he was chosen with the third overall pick in the 1984 NBA draft by the Chicago Bulls, his home for 14 seasons. A phenomenal athlete with unique combination of grace, power and artistry, Michael has single-handedly redefined the NBA superstar. He is not only the top player of his era, but is quite possibly the best player ever to wear the uniform. He's the youngest starting quarterback to win the Super Bowl and stands as one of the most notable players in the National Football League. He is the New England Patriots' Tom Brady. Tom was born on August 3, 1977 in California, studying at San Mateo's Serra High, where he earned Blue Chip Illustrated and Prep Football Report All-American selections, two of the highest accolades at that age. The Montreal Expos drafted Tom in the 18th round of the 1995 Major League Baseball draft as a catcher, but he chose college at the University of Michigan instead, where he played football and recorded a 25 record 
As a two-year starter, he majored in organizational studies. In his first season at Michigan, he was a redshirt freshman and was also a redshirt as a sophomore, where he served as Brian Bryce's backup during the Wolverines' victorious national championship season. But in his junior season, he earned All Big Ten Conference honorable mention, as well as academic All Big Ten pick. In his first year as the full-time starter, he completed 214 of 350 passes for 2,636 yards and 15 touchdowns. Only Jim Harbaugh threw more yards in a season for the Wolverines. Tom also set a school record for most attempts, 350, and completions, 214 in a season. Tom closed out his college career playing a pivotal role in the Wolverines' 35-24 overtime win against Alabama in the Orange Bowl. Following his senior season, Tom was drafted by the New England Patriots in the sixth round. In his first 162 attempts, Tom didn't throw an interception, and that streak is the longest to start a career in NFL history. It also ranked him third for most attempts without an interception in Patriots franchise history. In his first postseason start, Tom led New England to an exciting 16-13 overtime victory over the Oakland Raiders. With Tom's exceptional ability, his team has found the winning formula.